On the 16th of December 1951, a Curtiss C-46 twin-engine airplane crashed in the city of Elizabeth, New Jersey. The disaster was an immense shock to local residents, but it wouldn't be the last shock that they would have to endure. Over the next three months, two further crashes would take place, leading many who lived in Elizabeth to ask just what it was that was so deadly about the nearby Newark Airport. The airport that would eventually become Newark Liberty International Airport was opened in 1928 as Newark Metropolitan Airport. The airport was built on reclaimed land, land which had been filled in using whatever materials were available, including discarded Christmas trees and hundreds of bank safes from a local junkyard. It was, at the time, the only airport to serve the New York metropolitan area, and the only one in the country to have a fully paved runway. During the 1930s, the airport became one of the busiest commercial airports in the USA, though its popularity declined as other airports were built and opened. By the end of the 1930s, its facilities were considered out of date. It was officially closed in 1940, before being turned over for military use during World War II. After the war, the city leased the airport to the Port of New York Authority, who invested $50 million in modernizing and updating it, making it once again usable for commercial flights. While this would bring in valuable revenue for the city, it was not a development that everyone approved of. Newark Airport, though named for the city of Newark, was sandwiched between the cities of Newark and Elizabeth, with the configuration of runways meaning that many planes passed over Elizabeth as they took off or landed. Some residents of Elizabeth reported the low-flying planes creating huge amounts of noise, interfering with television reception, shaking the foundations of their houses, and causing a considerable degree of stress. Many complained, with some stating that they were suffering from aeronautical insomnia, as the constant flights overhead made it impossible to sleep. By 1951, Newark Airport was handling around 100,000 takeoffs and landings each year, with sometimes as many as 300 per day. The owners of the airport were not legally required to make any changes to address the concerns of Elizabeth residents, but mounting pressure led them to consider solutions. A plan to direct planes over the bay after takeoff was rejected, but work on a new runway began, this one oriented so that planes would not be taking off directly over Elizabeth. On the 16th of December 1951, a Miami Airlines Curtis C-46 twin-engine airliner departed from Newark, bound for Tampa in Florida. On board were 52 passengers and four crew. No sooner had the plane left the runway than smoke was spotted streaming from one engine. Air traffic controllers immediately cleared the plane to land again, telling the pilot that he had permission to land anywhere that he could, any way that he could. As the smoking engine burst into flames, the pilot in question, 30-year-old Albert Lyons, struggled to keep the plane airborne, let alone negotiate a landing. As it soared over Elizabeth, he did manage to steer it away from several apartment buildings. The plane clipped one unoccupied home, and then crashed into a disused water pumping station, exploding on impact. Witnesses would later remark that the pilot had managed to bring the plane down in the only place in the area which wasn't densely populated. As a result, only one person on the ground suffered any injuries. Firefighters rushed to the scene, but there was no chance to retrieve anyone from the wreckage alive. They brought the fire under control, struggling with frozen hoses in the icy weather, and began retrieving 56 bodies from the crash site. Due to the severity of the impact and the subsequent fire, several local dentists would report to the morgue to help identify victims in the days that followed. An investigation by the Civil Aeronautics Board, completed in the weeks after the crash, determined that the accident had been caused by the failure of studs holding together part of the engine. The failure of the studs led to engine damage, which led to a fire, which led to a drop in engine power, and a loss of control of the aircraft. On the 22nd of January 1952, American Airlines Flight 6780, a Convair CV240, was on its way from Syracuse to Newark, 
with 20 passengers and three crew members on board. It was a foggy day, and due to the low visibility, the captain, 33-year-old Thomas Reed, was preparing to make an instruments-only landing at Newark. At 3.45pm, Flight 6780 disappeared unexpectedly from radar screens, and simultaneously stopped answering radio calls. Witnesses on the ground saw the plane emerge from a bank of fog at a height that seemed far too low. It skimmed over the top of houses, clipped one, smashed straight through the upper floor of another, and crashed directly into a third, exploding into a ball of flame. Burning debris was thrown into the surrounding houses. Emergency personnel converged on the scene, but were driven back by the intense heat of the flames. Only once these were under control could they begin the process of rescuing the wounded from the wreckage, and retrieving the bodies of the dead. An operation complicated by the damp weather and the muddy and disrupted state of the ground around the crash site. Nobody on board the plane survived the crash, and seven people on the ground were also killed. Eleven more people on the ground were injured, some severely. Investigators had barely finished looking into the December crash. Now they were faced with another. An investigation looked into every possible cause that investigators could conceive of, and found no obvious reason why the crash had taken place. The final report on the reason for the crash was inconclusive. The residents of Elizabeth had now endured two crashes in two months. A growing number protested stridently against the continued use of Newark Airport, insisting that it should either be closed or investigated as a matter of urgency. This campaign against the airport was given weight by the identity of one of the dead. Robert Porter Patterson Sr. was a former war secretary, and thus was known personally by President Harry S. Truman. His loss brought events in Elizabeth to the attention of the nation's media. Before any action could be taken, however, yet another disaster would take place. On the 11th of February 1952, just after midnight, National Airlines Flight 101 took off from Newark Airport. Almost immediately, the plane encountered difficulties, with first one and then both engines suddenly failing. The captain, 46-year-old W.G. Foster, struggled to control the stricken aircraft. Controllers told him to return to the field, to which he replied simply, Can't make it. Thereafter, Captain Foster made no further communications, and dedicated all his energy to steering the plane away from Elizabeth and towards a nearby area of marshland. He also dumped fuel, in the hope that this would reduce the chance of fire and make the crash more survivable. In the end, however, he was unable to steer the plane clear of the city below. Flight 101 smashed through an apartment block, broke into two pieces, and crashed in the playground of an orphanage. The tail section remained intact and was briefly caught in a tree before falling to the ground. Some passengers from this section of the plane survived. The nose section of the plane caught fire and disintegrated, leaving no survivors. For the third time in as many months, emergency personnel attended the scene of the crash to do what they could. They were joined by the older children from the orphanage, who helped carry the injured away from the scene. The younger children, meanwhile, were herded away from the windows of the orphanage and offered glasses of milk to distract them. An investigation would later find that this third crash had been caused by a failure in the pitch control system of one of the plane's propellers. The crash killed 29 of the 53 occupants of the plane, and a further four people on the ground. At a press conference in the hours after the crash, Alfred Driscoll, governor of New Jersey, announced that Newark Airport would be closed with immediate effect, regardless of whether such a closure would normally be legal or not. The owners of the airport, the Port Authority of New York, agreed, and all flights from Newark were cancelled and the airport closed while an investigation took place. Feelings ran deep in Elizabeth, the residents of which had experienced three traumatic plane crashes in quick succession. Emergency responders were exhausted and troubled by what they had seen. Homes had been destroyed, children had lost parents, families had been devastated, 
and many residents now lived in a state of nervous tension, awaiting a fourth crash that seemed, at the time, almost inevitable. A thorough investigation, however, revealed that there was nothing specific about Newark Airport that had contributed to the crashes. It appeared to be pure coincidence that so many planes had crashed in such quick succession. There was no provable reason to permanently close or relocate the airport. Despite this finding, some changes were made before Newark Airport was reopened on the 15th of November 1952. The state of New York mandated that, wherever possible, takeoffs and landings should take place over water rather than over populated areas. President Harry Truman ordered an inquiry, as a result of which zoning laws were introduced to prevent hospitals, schools, and similar high-capacity buildings being built in areas where planes were likely to be taking off or landing. In the years since 1952, there have been no further plane crashes directly over Elizabeth. The sequence of impossibly unlikely events that struck the city in the winter of that year has not repeated itself. All the same, many people who live in Elizabeth still remember the time, many years ago now, when three plane crashes in three months devastated their community.